I'll be your moderator today. Uh, please allow me, for those of you who, who are with us at the previous uh, uh, space, to apologize to you because it ended prematurely and I didn't get a chance to thank you for participating and for uh, asking all those brilliant questions. Our question then was how, of course, the topic was Uganda Parliament Exhibition, how do we make Parliament accountable? And uh, today, we will, following that conversation, we will be discussing what, what the way forward should be. Uh, we have provided Atagora and everyone else who has been participating in the exhibition information uh, uh, showing that certain things are not going well, exposing the corruption, the irregular payments, uh, the entities that we expected to take action, that we expect to take action, uh, have not taken uh, that action as expected, at least from some of the uh, questions, issues you've been raising. I can see we have uh, Yusuf back, Toko. Would you like to give him the mic? I have. I have sent him the mic. Yes, so we are going to be discussing a way forward. How do we extend uh, this effort to ensure accountability and transparency, to ensure that those who are misappropriating uh, public resources are held accountable? I'm going to take the opportunity now to welcome all of you uh, panelists. I'll start with uh, Sisi Kagawa, um, a lawyer and anti-corruption crusader. Uh, we have Anderson Burora, the RCC Vaga. We have Dr. Yusuf Serunkuma, um, an academic and uh, activist as well, and columnist with the Observer. And we have uh, Gerard Karuhanga, a former member of parliament. You're welcome, all of you. I'm going to give uh, each one of us um, a minute to say hi to our audience and make quick introductory remarks. Please keep it under a minute. We'll get into the meet later. Over to you, Yusuf. Yusuf? If Dr. Yusuf is not ready, we can start with uh, Sisi Kagawa. Okay, um, hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sisi Kagawa, and I'm honored and glad to be part of the space. Over. Thank you, Sisi. Uh, Mr. Anderson, mic is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, I hope all is well, and... Uh, I hope we shall have the rest of the discussion as we go on. Thank you very much. Uh, Toko, would you like to check in with uh, Yusuf and to see if everything is okay? Yeah, sure, let me do that behind the scenes. You can carry on. Yes. Um, Sisi, I'll start with you. Um, you have been following the Uganda Parliament exhibition, uh, but I'll quickly go through some of the issues. We started with the payment of a service award to the LOP, leader of opposition and other commissioners, 500 million and 400 respectively. Uh, everyone seems to think, everyone thinks these were irregular payments, including uh, the Right Honorable Mathias Mpuga's own uh, political party, the National Unity Platform. Uh, but we've seen uh, this defended by senior uh, officials at parliament and members of parliament. We have also, I think today we received, oh, we got another batch of um, payments, illicit payments uh, from parliament uh, paid through, meant for official business, but paid through and withdrawn through accounts of selected members of staff. This practice has been used before in a major corruption uh, scandal, the office of the prime minister, and uh, officials then came out to say it was in violation of the Public Finance Management Act. Uh, we hosted the director of communications, Mr. Chris Obore, at parliament, and in his comments, he said, I do not condemn Anita for investing in her community, yet there are other leaders who have looted the government more but did nothing. A lot of these payments we've seen are in the name of corporate social responsibility, expenditure for the speaker. Just to start from there, is this corruption? Is it not corruption in your view? All right. Um, thank you so much. I think for me, one of the things that we need to appreciate with the exhibition is that um, information is power. And a lot of information has gone out. And that is why we've seen quite a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth when it comes to members of parliament and trying to defend what is happening. And, you know, when we talk of information is power, it isn't surprising, I think, in one of the spaces where I think Chris referred to the Official Secrets Act. And one thing that people need to know that where there's secrecy, corruption thrives. And many times we have seen some public officials come out and draw the card of the Official Secrets Act. But that same act is working in contravention of the Access to Information Act. Now, when you break it down and look at the Access to Information Act, you will realize that some of the information that uh, in most cases, ministries, departments and agencies do not want to put out. Most of them claim that it shouldn't be given out. But as per the Access to Information Act, that information is supposed to be given. I, You know, when we talk about corporate social responsibility and again, the, the response that Chris made, I look at it in two ways. This is money that is being drawn from the consolidated fund. And the speaker is a speaker for the whole country. 
country. She does not only represent Bukedea. Now, if money is being drawn from the consolidated fund and most of the monies are going towards a particular region, what does that actually say? It speaks volumes when it comes to uh, what corruption is. But and, and, and I think one thing that people need to look out for, you know, when you look at some of that information that um, Agatha has been continuously putting out, it's going to be important that we actually interrogate some of that information. I was looking at, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the first batches where you have 460 million being sent out, and this is what it says it's supposed to do, being advanced as a corporate social responsibility by the speaker for the evaluation of the impact of corporate social responsibility. Now, for people that have done projects, in most cases we know, if you're looking at impact, one, impact is long term, and when you're talking of impact, you should be looking at things like increased employment, improved life, livelihood, and also a good, good practice demands that impact evaluation is done by external consulting entities in order to be objective. So when you find that the same people that are giving themselves money are the same people that are actually trying to check themselves, obviously checks and balances are not working. And I think for me that is obviously wrong. And we and I think as Ugandans, we just need to continuously interrogate the particular budget lines and break it down. Otherwise, there's too much English that is being used where some of these monies are being siphoned out. So I, I think when I, what I need to add Ugandan is let us even look at the respective columns and let us break it down. What, what does it mean when you say you're going to evaluate the corporate social responsibility? Has it been done after five years? And again, we know that usually impact evaluation, according to international standards, should be about 5% of the project cost. Now, again, going back to just that one uh, budget item, if let us just say that the total is 460 million, I mean, they say it's an advance, but let us just look at 460 million. That would mean um, the, probably the, the, the total project cost will be around 9.2 billion. Now, if 9.2 billion is corporate social responsibility, obviously this rivals government ministerial allocations. And can the government not do these projects under the various ministries, departments, and agencies without spending all this money? So obviously there's blunt abuse of public resources. But again, we need to know that what we are seeing now is not new. What is changing are the levels of uh, well, the, 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 the increase in the monies. That is what we are seeing. But we also, I mean, if you have to look backwards, some of these things have already uh, were actually happening. What is changing right now, I think, are the faces and the different players. So the system has always been the way it is. But we also need to be cautious of the fact that what we are seeing is a mirror of what we have seen before. I mean, we've had a very good president on a number of occasions come out and say that he's going to lead the fight against corruption. He knows who the corrupt are. We still haven't seen our good president come out and say anything about all this that is coming out. Well, I, we also need to see Shaku, the State House Anti-Corruption Unit. We are yet to see something. Of course, the inspectors of government said we're going to take it up and do some form of investigation. That is yet to be done. But I think for me, we have seen blunt and abuse of uh, public resources in as far as, because this money is coming from uh, the consolidated fund. And I think that is why as Ugandans and as taxpayers, we, are, we should actually be very, very concerned. Over. Thank you. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sisi. Uh, okay. Yes, Toko. Just an update. Yusuf had said he was walking home, so he asked for 15 minutes. So for okay. that time, we can, we can keep counting. I'm still looking for the other panelist, uh, okay. General Karuhanga. All right. Thank you, Toko. Uh, Sisi, to just, just to pick it from where you, you, you left it, I mean, you, you talk about impact, but a lot of this question has been framed, or the exhibition has been framed as an attack on the uh, Speaker of Parliament. Just, just so Ugandans understand, this practice of paying money for official business through uh, personal accounts, accounts of individuals. It just just break it down for people who may not understand because there may be people who are saying the money was budgeted as money for CSR activities for the speaker. The same money was withdrawn for the speaker. So what's, what is the issue? What is this all cool about? Just break down for our listeners, some of who may not understand uh, how irregular or regular this is. Okay, when you look at the various um, auditor general's reports, just go back years behind. The practice of putting uh, monies on personal accounts is one of the audit queries that the auditor general has continuously raised. Now, we need to appreciate that this is uh, government of Uganda money. And you cannot, because at the moment you start putting it on your personal account, how do you hold you accountable? That is why you find that there are already established bank accounts for ministries, departments, and agencies. And also, when you look at the Auditor General's report, I mean, many, not even only this one, quite a number of Auditor General's reports, where he raises the issue of putting government resources on public, on a personal account. And it is not only Parliament, by the way, that has been doing it. There are also some other ministries and departments and agencies, that, even at local government level, that have done this. So we are seeing a practice that is continuously happening because it hasn't been checked ever since the Auditor General has, has raised some of these issues. So the, the, the challenge is, you can, the moment you put money, uh, government money on your account, how do you hold you accountable? How do you, how do you account? But also, how do we know that actually this money will not be abused? 
And again, what is interesting, let me just give an example. If you look at just this information right now that I think Agatha has brought out right now, if you look at between 11th and 16th October, how much money was put on people's account? It's around 2 point something billion. Now, that is a lot of money. How is this money accounted for? How is it withdrawn? You, and and, and, and as, long as, it, as long as money is coming from the consolidated fund, it should be going to the respective entities, entities account. It shouldn't be going to personal account. Because the moment it goes on a personal account, oversight becomes very difficult. But again, this is consolidated. I mean, this money is coming from the consolidated fund. And it should be, if it's parliament money, they should, be, they should be a specified account and not going to an individual's account. But and, and I think for me, the reason, again, why I think this has continued to happen is because we've seen situations where by the Auditor General's reports are not taken serious. And you see, the irony is the Auditor General comes up with a report and hands over the report to parliament. Now, the Auditor General has audited parliament and well, the Auditor General is giving the report to parliament. Again, well, well that's what the constitution is. But it's a bit ironical that the same report that is going to be uh, probably raising certain irregularities is being handed over to the same parliament that has also been implicated. But by and like the issue of putting money in personal account is something that the Auditor General has continuously raised and uh, it has been red flagged. But this is something that government has actually failed to work on. And that is why you find that that practice continues. And again, people need to understand that the Auditor General is part of government. So if a government body comes out and says this and this and this is wrong, it should not happen. But the same government ignores its own arm, of its other arm that has put in place to check it. Then that obviously shows that we still have a very big problem in as far as holding our leaders accountable because they themselves fail to put in place the same recommendations that the same government ministries have been put in place to do. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, Anderson, the, the biggest question on everyone's mind today is why the, uh, the government has not come out strongly to make any official statement on what is going on at Parliament. What's, what's your reading of, of this kind of attitude? Well, um, I think government has uh, all the reasons to have responded. However, this having started as an act of uh, activism on social media, uh, what would require would be maybe the, the biggest person who could have acted would be the, the IGB, in this case, we're still waiting for a whistleblower, even when the information is all over the public and uh, in all domains. Yes, mm. there is, uh, there is uh, a lot of reluctance. Anderson, just, just and, a minute. Yeah. You, you, you seem to have a lot of background noise. Are you able to yeah. step away from... Uh, or you're sure. constrained? So sure I can. Okay, thank you. you, can, you can. So, I think what is the best now is that the consistency of the information I hope you are able to hear me now. Yes, it's much better. Okay. The consistency in the information being shared actually now gives enough room for anyone who called this social media attacks now uh, an opportunity to look into deeper. However, when an attack you know, is on an institution like Parliament, uh, with acts and uh, all allegations is on a speaker who is the number three in the country, then there is every reason to find ways through which such a matter is handled because it has a lot of uh, other aspects that one should put in place. Case in the point, we would see how the case between Chagurani and Huga has been treated, where these other people are saying it has been mishandled, the other are saying that is the way it was supposed to be done. But I am pretty sure that eventually, government will come in to make all the necessary steps required to take it on. It has happened before. You remember when the, the Mavati case came in, it took a little bit longer, but at least some actions were taken. But now, where it is disturbing again, besides the government, parliament is, a, is an accountability house. It is the, an entity that is supposed to be holding everyone accountable, including the executive and the judiciary. So all of these inter entities we are calling for uh, to take action, actually are supposed to be even checked by the same parliament. So, uh, uh, some of my colleagues earlier on were saying we should uh, stage a demonstration to march to parliament. But we have members of parliament who are elected and are sent to parliament to do exactly what now citizens are trying to do by themselves. So, as we ask so many questions around, even within in-house, there are so many other questions to ask. And this paradox can only be uh, opened if citizens assert their position, most especially towards accountability. As uh, I was uh, talking to one of the, 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 the persons in the, in the IGG, and they told me they were coming in to take action. But my worry is, now this is uh, my own observation, and uh, I stand to be corrected. I don't think the IGG in this case will come in and give us justice. 
we had the case of uh, one of the bosses of uh, Ubos who came and admitted that he gave a bribe to acquire a contract. And the IGB acquitted uh, that same person. So to me, I am still doubtful. And I think this audit in Parliament uh, should be investigated by an independent firm whereby conflict of interest cannot arise and whereby favoritism and the protecting the, the, the arm of government from such cases might not arise. Because now, this is a case that involves taxes. This is a case that involves uh, a country that is highly indebted. indebted. Uh, the debts are choking us. The parliament that is passing the, 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 the loan is the same parliament that is spending the legislature. So I um, it's quite a number of questions, and uh, the answers might be fewer. The reason why action is not taken also might be another point of concern. But uh, uh, the government, I'm very sure it will come up. But my point of discernment is that will government come in and feed its own to the right direction, or there will be a compromise in that regard. Over to I think Thank you, thank you very much, uh, 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 Anderson. Choko, do we do we yes, know whether uh, Dr. Yusuf is back and do we have a word on uh, Honorable, Honorable Karuhanga? Honorable Karuhanga, I'm working on. I'm trying to find him so I can make him a speaker. But you have to make me co-host because now I'm only a speaker. Okay. As for Yusuf, I think you could try him because you had said 15 minutes about that. Uh, Yusuf, Dr. Yusuf, Yusuf, are you there? No, I don't think I don't think he's back. Uh, back to you, uh, back to you, Sisi. You said what we are seeing is a is a change. Or faces, but it's been happening. In my recollection, it's the very first time we are seeing a corruption of this scale at Parliament, which, as 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 Anderson has pointed out, plays a very important role of oversight. Is isn't this a shift? Uh, this is, a, I mean, an institution that uh, ordinary Ugandans are supposed to depend on to perform the oversight role, but it's it's a neck deep in uh, in this sea of corruption, at least according to the. Uh, the revelations that, that that are coming out on on uh, in this in this exhibition. Right. Um, thank you. I, I think. I mean, just like I said, right now we are seeing a lot of uh, what has changed. One is the modus operandi of how this information has come out. But the issues of uh, Parliament being a clearing house. I mean, that has act, trust me, that has already been there. It was already there. But also the abuse of resources and you know not abiding by certain procedures. If anyone can just go and read, you know, previous Auditor General's reports, you'll find uh, some of those anomalies there. Of course, right now what we see that has changed are the huge. And obscene amount of monies and the total and blatant failure to abide by uh, established processes. But again, when we talk of people giving themselves money, that has always been there. And what we need to know that as long as Parliament has the power to determine, you know, monies that go to them, that the, the whole issue of uh, abuse of taxpayers' money is always going to happen. Because I, I remember that a civil society on a number of occasions would come out, make noise, tell them guys what you're doing is wrong. And you realize that in, in most cases, what Parliament does, the first, the, the, usually the whole increase of salaries and their paychecks usually comes in uh, a few months after they've joined Parliament. And I mean, th that has always been, you know, business as usual. The only thing that has happened now that is different is that there's been a lot of information that is coming out, which information I'm sure was also there before, because right now we've kept on evolving using different platforms, using social media. Then we're not really using so much uh, social media as it is right now. And then also the fact that uh, people are able to whistleblow to particular individuals and give them this money, so I give them information. That has actually changed. But in as far as what we're seeing right now being in parliament has always been there. But this time around, I think the monies are huge the monies are huge and also another challenge of course that we've seen is that previously we would see you know uh you know praise from parliament come out and you know some uh, particular media houses would pick up particular issues in parliament now that is not happening as it used to happen before so i i, I think for me right now what you see there's a lot of gagging i think when it comes to journalists that are working in parliament whether it is deliberate or it's out of fear no one knows but we haven't really seen some of this information uh you know coming out but what i know is that this has always happened what is what has kept on changing are the huge and obscene amounts of monies that particular members within parliament are aware themselves over no, thanks the just today as even as we discuss there are reports uh, disturbing if you like that uh, uh, our members of parliament are collecting money bribes if you if, if you if you if you will in the midst of these allegations there's no restraint there's no sense of oh let's at least for this uh, situation to first cool down i think it was yesterday when we had a a member of parliament saying that uh you know calling a press conference and declaring the, the exhibition as an attack on a speaker and saying that a, an attack on a speaker is an attack on all of them uh what i mean what does that say the, the attitude that members of parliament have uh 
uh, towards the public this sense of you know it doesn't it doesn't matter we can go ahead with uh, whatever we are doing uh, Hagai, i think over time uh, we've seen precedents being made and that is why you find that there's a lot of impunity, that even despite the fact that some of this information is coming out, because precedents have been set, you realize that the levels of impunity have also gone high. Now, I find it rather sad that a member of parliament can actually come out and even propose having a press conference to hit back at, the, at, the, you know, at this whole campaign that is going on. That actually shows you that you have people who do not want to be held accountable. The, the good thing and the right thing that should have been done by those that were you know, calling for press conference on allegations that are particular individuals within parliament had been attacked, the right thing to do is to respond to these allegations, because this is taxpayers money. And if this is taxpayers' money, then taxpayers are supposed to hold those that are representing them accountable. And I think maybe some members of parliament tend to forget what their roles and responsibilities are. Because a member of parliament is a representative of particular constituencies. And if a member of parliament is representing people, then the people that are being represented are supposed to hold them accountable. So it is actually absurd that anyone can actually even think of attempting to call a press conference because people are demanding for accountability. It is actually sad and I know that it's sad, or it, but it, it is so wrong. And it's actually an insult to Ugandan taxpayers. The taxpayers are saying, look here, yeah, you guys are not using our money as well. Consider the cost of living, standard of living. It's not only you that are suffering. Now, when citizens come out and call for accountability, and then a group within parliament says, well, you are attacking us, I think that is so lame. We would have expected better from members of parliament, other than thinking that they're going to call for a press conference because they're angry. I don't really think, as you, actually, I think you currently, as Ugandans, are more angry than them. And the whole thing of them thinking that they're going to intimidate Ugandans by calling press conferences because, you know, people are calling for accountability. It is so wrong because as long as a person is a public officer or official, they will always be called to account. So any member of parliament who thinks that if citizens come out and demand for accountability, that they should not actually be held accountable. I think those I think they should just shop out and leave Parliament. Those who feel that they cannot be held accountable, they can actually leave because you have a community, a group of people that have actually become liabilities to the country. You cannot. I mean, and I think, I think at times some of, I think because of the levels of impunity, you find that members of Parliament over time tend to think just insulting the intelligence of Uganda, which I think is so wrong, and uh, thinking that they're going to come out half and half and scare Ugandans, that they're not happy that people are calling them to, to order and that Ugandans are going to be intimidated. I think that is wrong. What we'd want to see members of parliament come out and do, other than calling for press conferences, is to avail information and to address the issues that the citizens are actually raising. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, are you back by any chance? <coughs> Hi, uh, hi, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, they, you, you, you uh, have been nudging our good friends at Parliament to take some kind of action against the Speaker. Uh, just also help help us frame because uh, again, the good people there have claimed that this is an attack on uh, on this on the Speaker. You've participated in the exhibition from the very day it started. Just help us frame it uh, as as you see it, as you think other Ugandans see it, and make and uh, comment briefly about the attitude of of, of the members of Parliament. Uh, I mean, I, I want to start with a small matter. There's a small matter, uh, in my assessment, a small one, uh, regarding uh, my friend Chris O'Boy receiving cash and other members of his team receiving cash onto their accounts, and this being marked as corporate social responsibility. First of all, uh, in, if, if you're going to give money to a mosque in Bukedia, that mosque must have an account. Money, government money, which is public money, is often channeled through a paper trail. So that money has to go to the account of the mosque so that everybody involved in that paper trail can see that this money reached the end user. And I guess that you can then go back and see how the money was used. If you don't give this money to a church, anyway, in Bukedia, you don't hand over cash to the bishop or to the, uh, the head priest or whoever is responsible. The church has to have an account which you pass money onto, right? So here we're dealing with a situation where either Chris Obori goes to the bank and withdraws cash and hands it over to whoever is the recipient. Or uh, Chris Obori is the department of government of Uganda, but then Chris Obori sits at his desk and allocates money. You know, he opens, he does this, uh, electronic, electronic banking, opens up his, his computer and then starts channeling money to the, end, the designated end user, in this case, could be a church, a mosque, uh, and a group of market women who organize themselves together, and then Chris O'Brien does the, the, back of, the work of sober accounting officer. You see, so unless Chris O'Brien is dealing in cash, which will be absolute money laundering, uh, it's, it's, it's mind boggling that, you know, a bank allowed Chris O'Brien, or parliament allowed Chris O'Brien to open up an account in the name of government of Uganda, which is parliament.
But I think it's not a small matter, uh, Haga, if you allow me. It's a small matter that the more we inter interrogate the idea that Chris Obore, and as Agatha told us, I think it was yesterday, uh, or, the, or the other day, that even drivers are receiving money on behalf of the speaker to do corporate social responsibility. The more we interrogate this, the more it becomes a defeatist interrogation. What we're dealing with here is, is a cartel. It's a network. Haga, you know, in Uganda, if you are dealing in money, I should tell you from personal experience, I was, I was a, when I was a graduate student, we used to get scholarships from Social Science Research Council of New York. They used to send us more money, such as 3,000 US dollars. 3,000 US dollars. Now, for, the bank used to call us to explain why we were getting 3,000 US dollars from uh, meant for a scholarship, to explain where it came from and what it's going to be used for. And the bank would explain that this is money meant, this explanation is meant for the Financial Intelligence Authority. It was a requirement that you talk back to the Financial Intelligence Authority to know why monies are coming to the country and who and for what is this money going to be used for. You know, think for a second that we are dealing in hundreds of millions going onto the personal account of an individual, a driver, a head of something, and that money is explained as government of Uganda work meant to do social, corporate social responsibility. I can guarantee you, Hagar, Financial intelligence authority has to be aware of how this entire process began. There is no way you're going to pull this off without the involvement of the financial intelligence authority. And by extension, there is no way you're going to pull this off without the involvement of a particular bank where either Chris O'Brien goes and withdraws cash or Chris O'Brien uses their services to do electronic money transfers for the intended end user. You're looking at a cartel, you're looking at a network of thieves. Which doesn't stop at Parliament, which doesn't stop at the drivers who are involved in receiving this money. These are the smallest players. In this entire game, you're looking at people in FIA, you're looking at uh, uh, the banking structure of Uganda. You, you remember yesterday, I think it was the other day when, when the, the first space that we had, and, and uh, Agatha uh, alleged that Chris O'Brien was interrogated by Financial Intelligence Authority, and very confidently, Chris O'Brien said that ever since he was born, he has never been interrogated by FIA. I have seen Chris's response came from a strong place because he knows FIA, we are working together. They are either his employers or his accomplices. So he knows, he could tell in his voice, he said, ever since I've lived on this world, I have never been targeted by FIA. In a matter which is blatantly a matter for FIA, FIA interrogation. You see, so we need to sort of open up our horizons of interrogation and stop looking at just parliament. These monies have showed us that we have a network of thieves. You see, that's, that's the first point. But the point of interrogating uh, how money ends on two Christopher accounts and the other folks is a very small matter. The bigger one for me is that we're looking at a network, a network of thieves. From which we're from the top. Uh, the, the second point I wanted to, am I still within time, Hade? Yes, yes, go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, but keep it, keep yeah. it under a minute. I'll give you more time, time later. Okay. Uh, you know, I want to start asking this question. I, I tweeted about it. What is it that is in Parliament that we don't know? There's something in Parliament that we don't know that even seemingly like idealistic people go there and all of a sudden they become fused. They become entangled. Their hands are soiled. What is it that is in Parliament that we don't know? Because you see, every single day, every after election, we send good people to Parliament. We send people that we believe have the hearts of the country at heart. We believe they embody our dreams, our, transparent, our ideas of transparency, our ideas of accountability. But what is it in this Parliament that we don't know? Right? And I'm starting to think uh, about this, especially I'm thinking through the life of uh, Dr. Tuck Kagabo, the NUP member who now claims to belong to NUP, but also belongs to the MK movement. I see him, I want to think about this guy as a man who went to parliament with wonderful ideas, with, with a belief in transparency and serving the community. But a moment he landed in this house, he got entangled, he got confused. And now he doesn't even know where he stands. And I think we need to start interrogating what is in this space that you see, it can't just be, Chris O'Brien was very idealistic, you know, I mean, I think for the entire day today, uh, Godwin has done a wonderful job in showing us who Chris O'Brien was before he became the Chris O'Brien that we are, you know, looking at right now. You know, from the reporters of Parliament, our wonderful journalists, those who work within Parliament, people that we voted for, especially on the NUP ticket, for example, or independents, people that we felt they embodied the aspirations of the Wanaichi. How did they get entangled in all this mess? What is in this house? Right, so I'll build that point a little yeah, later on, if you allow me, but I have a start at that point. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll build, I'll return to it later. Yes, yes, yeah. please. Uh, Toko, I saw you raising your hand. Godwin? If Hager, Godwin is not... I, I, I didn't raise my hand. I just wanted to 
to, to put a thumbs up for you, so when you mention my name. And also Gerald is here now, I hope you notice. Okay, thanks. I thought actually that's what you meant too. You're welcome, uh, Honorable Gerard Karahanga. Uh, would you like to say hi briefly to our listeners and uh, then we take it with a, with a question or two? Gerard, are you there? Gerard, I think you may be muted. Please, if, if, if you can hear me, unmute. Gerard, if, if Gerard is not there, Yusuf, you, 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 you made uh, good points about, you called it a small matter, but it's, it's, it's yeah, <laughs> I guess. Uh, the question of money, uh, just now, and I can see some of, the, uh, some of the members in the audience have shared reports about money, even today as we speak. Uh, they are reports, and I'll ask you, Anderson, to comment in case you've got wind of the same information, but there are reports that uh, legislators are, have been picking money today, others have sent others, some of it uh, from a parliament basement, some of it from the uh, speaker's house, some of it from uh, the, even the office of the president. Uh, this information has been shared by, uh, I can see, Mr. Kakwenza in the audience and a few others. Uh, we are in the midst of a crisis. Everyone, at least online, there's an, an outpouring of frustration. But at the same time, money is being shared. And I understand that this is a... The balance of so you guys may remember a few months ago the 100 million that was promised to MPs in order for them to pass the supplementary budget. Uh, reports back then were that they received 50 million of, of, of that money. Uh, when this uh, exhibition turned on the heat, they started raising concerns that everybody else, their leaders, the parliamentary leadership is swimming in money, they have left out to dry, yet they are expected to uh, defend uh, these actions. So today they are receiving. Uh, the balance of 50 million, million shillings. Would you like to comment on this? And I imagine you have already seen these reports online. Uh, would you like to comment on the same, uh, Anderson? Anderson, I dropped. I'm trying to send him the link to become a speaker again. Um, just, just, just give it a second. Uh, or you could go to Yusuf as I do that. Yes. And I, I, I encourage, I can see some of the uh, members who have been, or members in the audience who have shared this information. When we open up the mics to all of you, please feel free to make comments and uh, share as much information as you can on the same. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll get back to you now. Yes? Uh, just also to, to say what I know, um, a friend of mine who is an MP told me about that same money. It's the first thing I woke up and found on my, on my WhatsApp. Um, the, the MP said, the, MP, the people are going to receive that money. She, she mentioned, I think, 50 million and said that um, they're going to receive it in different tranches. Some will get it from the speaker's house in Akasero, uh, she was very categorical about that, then said others will receive it from the president's office, something like that, and then they said um, some will receive it from the parliament basement today morning. So yes, um, th th that has been known, and I knew that very early in the morning, and he said that is part of the money that they were supposed to receive for passing the supplementary budget, which of course you remember, Agatha shared about, and she was called all sorts of names, she was called a liar, she was called all these things, and she, despite holding forth and saying it is truthful, um, and, 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 and with time you're going to see, there are going to be videos and pictures circulating, because I've already seen some elsewhere, um, it seems to, to confirm that, yeah, that money is being given, even as we speak right now. Thank you very much, uh, Toko. Uh, before you came in, I had asked Anderson, but I, I, I imagine he missed the question. Honorable Gerard Karhanga, are you able to talk to us now? Yes, I can. I'm here. I don't know whether you can hear me well. Yes, I can. Um, great. Uh, it's indeed uh, great to be here and having um, a very critical and important engagement. Um, I think one of the things that we must really uh, uh, take uh, keenly for starters uh, is how did we end up here? How... Um, is it possible that um, a country that has uh, quite a number of land people, exposed people, um, people who, who cherish values, who care about an, each other and, uh, to, to a large extent, how did we end up in this place where public resources are swindled and that's basically like the, like the order of the day? That's the norm. I think, um, firstly, uh, well, let's appreciate that um, everything has its stemming point. We have um, had a culture in Parliament that has been building for some time. That you have um, a leadership, and here I'm, I'm referring to even about three, four parliaments in the past. So you, you have leadership in Parliament um, that is seen by members, and here I mean the speaker and, and the deputy and probably the commission. Uh, so the members look at them as, 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 as bread, bread donors. And so 
over time, I, I could see this um, for the two terms I was in parliament. I could see year in, year out. The, pre- the, the subsequent year would be worse than the previous year. Where members uh, cook up something, uh, either if it's not through a committee, it is uh, largely on the floor, or it's through the commission, and, and, and they come up with an idea of how to obtain money uh, through the coffers uh, um, of, of, of parliament, uh, of course, uh, picking from the consolidated fund. Now, so we, this has been a, 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 a culture that has been building over time. And uh, so now we are really actually, uh, we are now at the tip of the iceberg. So we have, eventually it had to bust. And so if you recall, uh, um, uh, co- colleagues were here, um, some time back when, um, when COVID was, uh, the COVID, uh, um, when, when it broke out and, and then uh, government decided to, to, to come up with a budget. And remember, they, they, when the MPs came up with an idea of each member going home with uh, 20 million. Uh, for me, I felt like now at that point, we had now reached at uh, the worst of places. And so I said, no, uh, I, I called colleagues and said, we have to do something about this. Uh, we, have, uh, we have to do something about this. And so, and members said, what can you do? So this is a culture that has been built over time uh, that has so many dimensions. So the second dimension is telling a member or members who ordinarily should be objective. The rest of the majority trying to literally go for them and, and persuade them and convince them that you can't achieve much. That what can you do? That this is, I mean, if you don't eat this money, if you don't get it, then the others will get it. Fellows in the ministries will steal it. Uh, fellows in, in, in other uh, uh, MDS, authorities and, and, and state enterprises. So, so, so and, and, and you could see that it had taken so much deep root. That people would really go out of their way, members of parliament, to even explain and persuade you that you can't achieve much. And on this particular case, I said, no, no, no. I said, look, I know I have a number of friends in this house. I am going to hurt them and they will probably be very pissed. I, and so I decided to engage on the floor of parliament and said, what we're about to do was very wrong. I wasn't surprised that I was heavily heckled. I couldn't even continue with the, the minority report from the budget committee. And uh, I thought that the speaker would really, because I pleaded with her, I thought she would give us at least the very minimum opportunity at least be had. And when this didn't happen, and I could see, and then there were a few members really who came around to more or less protect me physically, you can imagine. And uh, I said, okay, so where does this go? So I took off another three days to think through it because I didn't want to act out of anger. And I realized this was actually challengeable in courts of law. And that's how we ended up in court. And that's how uh, members of parliament, including the speaker, had to return the 20 million shillings. Now that didn't excite many. Actually, most of the MPs were really mad at me. I think up to now there are those who really think I... Uh, um, that they really they are exactly not, not exactly happy with me. However, that was never my intention. My intention was to do the right thing, to, to pass some hope, to pass some, some, some sense of hope. Because, you know, the, the truth is, in this country, with what we see so prevalent, like right now, what we're seeing in Parliament now, can very easily take out any sense of hope to the extent that you have almost the entire country resigned. So people just give up and say, you know what, this is all a mess, we're in madness, we can't uh, do much, so to whom it may concern, let the Almighty do his whatever he can do. So we, we just put our hands up and, and wait for providence. Now, and, and that for me, I think is probably the way the regime would want this country to be for them to remain in power as long as possible. So that, you know, because, I mean, think about it. There are so many crimes that have been committed by when you, you go through what uh, the, the exhibition uh, has been displaying. The evidence is so glaring. Public money is released on documents. So, so many signatures happen. People keep copies of these documents in different offices. So, picking evidence and prosecuting some of the individuals that are involved in, in, in this mess is that quick, is that easy, because the evidence is overwhelming. But it's like nothing has happened. The government is looking at the other side, the executive, I mean, here. Um, and, and, and so, probably saying, oh, yeah, at least the public is seeing them. And maybe, let's, uh, at least now, they're focusing on them. Uh, meanwhile, we can buy some more time and, and probably end up in, in the next election. You know, um, the degree of imp- the degree of impunity that we have in this country is, um, is not, it has been built over time. It, has, um, it hasn't just happened. Yes. So, just, Honorable, you, you make a good point about trust and, and, and trust in institutions is really uh, fundamental for, for democracy. You, you mentioned a good point about the impact of these things, uh, erode trust, uh, the erosion of trust in these, in these institutions. The information we are getting is that uh, the money is being picked tonight and that the timing of it is such that it it uh, it it facilitates the pushback against the uh, the Uganda Parliament exhibition. Now, Ugandans would imagine that these the people at Parliament see that for the very first time 
there's, there's a an unprecedented outpouring of frustration, of anger. Of why, why would, why would the the distribution of money then uh, happen now? Continue happening now? Is this how it would happen in your in your time? They, for instance, in the case of the twenty million, do you uh, think that the exhibition is 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 that threatening to, to the powers that be? You know, firstly, um, people really need to. Uh, I, I think need to know what happens in in that house. So the bonanza of giving out money to parliamentarians is for, in there is, is more or less like a routine. It's, it's, so I, in fact, I think the members, especially those who were there in, in the previous term, who were serving more than one term and are still in parliament, they must be saying, you fellows, I mean, they, for them probably are finding it like, like, why are these fellows surprised? Like this is, so in there, I can tell you for a fact that almost every quarter or at least I think at least half a year, there was money exchanging hands from the state to members of parliament. If it wasn't on a bill, it was on, um, uh, on, on, a, on a policy. If it wasn't on a policy, it would be, it, it would be all sorts of things. And, and members had, had, had mastered a culture, more or less, uh, it was more or less like a ransom arrangement. So you give us or we don't do this. You give us or we don't do this. You give us money or we don't do this. And so to the extent that people don't probably, uh, don't, didn't capture this well, can you imagine... A member of parliament walking into a caucus and asking, asking that you, you, Mr. President, if you don't give us 800 million, we are not each of us. We are not going to change this constitution for you. And, and then they negotiated it downwards until it came to 200 million shillings, and that's how the constitution was changed. So, the the, the 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 practice has always been in that house. Now it has now of course got into the ceiling, and it's it's certainly not surprising. Uh, I I can imagine. So if you say that, for instance, money is exchanging hands this evening to manage what's what's going on. Uh, in these spaces, I would not at all have an iota of, of any doubt, because I know that money exchange hands even for the for the smallest of things. So it's it's a very very ugly case. And, and actually, what informed uh, my decision to go to court uh, with a colleague, uh, Honourable uh, Odul, was to say, but this culture is going to end up where? Maybe let's have this case. It's going to upset so many people. People would be so mad at us. I mean, then the members of parliament. But we knew the Ghanaians would certainly be with us, and. And so that's when we said, you know what, if this can help to some extent expose a bit of this, and maybe people have eventually, the, the subsequent parliamentarians get a bit shy to engage in these things, then maybe this should. But unfortunately, that didn't help at all. Uh, parliament changed the leadership, and then there were overwhelmingly new members who now, of course, now the culture had taken so much root that now we can only see the offshoots day by day, day by day, day by day. And so... Ugandans really need, this is a very wonderful initiative. What's happening here on these spaces is what we need to do. We need to wake up, get out of our comfort zones, and push these fellows. I can tell you, when people, I mean, it's like chasing a thief in a market. If there are only two, three voices, the thief will easily get out with it. If there are hundreds and hundreds of individuals, and then thousands of them, I can assure you, eventually, the very thief himself will even be overwhelmed by the noise, and probably they will collapse on their own, and then they will be captured and punished accordingly. So, I appeal to every Ugandan out there, whether you're a university student, a teacher or a lecturer, or a bishop or a sheikh, please, let's speak out loudly, engage, and really pursue these fellows who have chosen to make stealing from the public their own culture and way of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Uh, Anderson, the, the, you, you know, you, you had expressed the hope that uh, uh, the government entities, including the IGG, uh, are likely to take action. But what Gerard is describing seems to be beyond uh, redemption. And, and I imagine from your days of uh, the jobless uh, brotherhood, when you, 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 know, you are deeply immersed in, in activism, you, you would have taken some kind of action back then. What, why do you think, I mean, Gerard says things have gotten worse. Why, do you, why are you optimistic that there be any action? Um, uh, thank you. I uh, hope so I am clear now. Yes, you are. Yeah, for the record, I have uh, I have worked with the jobless brotherhood, but I have never belonged to the jobless brotherhood. Though, as a, an activist, I have worked with them. Before. However, I think the the targets now are changing, and uh, the levels of awareness of the public has also increased, and we have a number of them taking track uh, of what is taking place. Uh, demanding for accountability and also knowing their rights 
in the vis a vis what the government is supposed to do for them and their participation. Some, some of them, a uh, number of them at the moment know uh, what taxes mean and what service delivery is. And I think that is a, a very, very good milestone we have taken. And uh, uh, if, if, if that is the case, then actually this time would be if pursued or if uh, pursued by those who can read or who can uh, understand what it is actually to do, I think the, the, the citizens can demand for whoever is doing uh, what is against their, their will. But what is important to note is that what we have at hand is beyond what one, what one would do, maybe, uh, you know, for a go, or what one would say, let it pass, or what one would say, everyone has done this. Uh, let's, let our own also eat. We have heard it in the past where that where by if one gets office, they say to Funya Kuria, Nanga Batuwa de Kuriam, and the case is Kuriam and not to serve. That is why you can see such things happen. There are so many things that are happening in Parliament, and most of them are illegal. And it is surprising that it is happening at the watch of experienced leaders, at the watch of uh, legal mind, at the watch of the cream de la cream of the country, as you might say. First, the parliament, today, if I can ask Honorable Gerard, if he knows the, um, the, the salary of the speaker and the deputy speaker, I doubt if he knows. I doubt if Gerard knows that uh, MPs are earning differently. Of recent, I was told that even the mileage of some MPs who are loyal to the speaker, their mileage was reviewed. And you, w w there was an incident whereby some received about 300 million, 200 million, 60 million, something that does not even match with their... With their uh, uh, mileage as per the, the rules uh, that guide the, the payments. But also, if the parliament is to increase its pay, there must be a resolution. It cannot be that it is uh, classified. Uh, if you go to parliament today and you ask them, did they see their budget activity plan or work plan of the last financial year or this financial year? No one will tell them what the amount was. They all see the activity that will take place, but without knowing how much it will cost. That's why you can see all of that money is being taken out because no one knows what he was meant to do. I am doubtful if Parliament would have passed a budget that has maybe 15 billion that are going to corporate social responsibility. I don't think Parliament itself doesn't know how much it is spending. It knows how much it is earning, but it doesn't know what it is spending. It is absurd that such things are happening at the watch of legislators. Now, you ask yourself, what is it that Parliament is doing to us, or is doing for us. How can the Parliament now audit? How can it grieve its uh, the other accounting officers? Who are the chief accounting officer to me? Who would be Parliament? Who would be exemplary? Who would be showing the others what to do? Is actually in a mess. It does not make sense. It does not make sense that at this particular moment, we have now to whip those who are supposed to whip us. We have now to ask members of Parliament to tell us what is happening in their house but in actual sense, they also don't know what is taking place. And that is dangerous. And that is where I think, well, I am an activist, and that's why I am taking a very, very big, bold step. You don't think that there is a threat to me. You don't think there is a threat to my job. You don't think that maybe I have been asked to back down. All of these things have been happening for the last two weeks. Actually, for the last two, three months, I am being told how I am being against the public standing as the public standing order. But what is important now is that we cannot all keep quiet and watch others drowning our country, slowing service delivery, making sure they break each and everything. Now, what is interesting is, Chris, Chris said, Chris is saying now the, 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 the exhibition being turned into an attack. Since when did some people become immune to accountability? Why is it that every time we raise accountability issues, it becomes an attack on an individual, and no one wants to ask Ray what exactly the individual is doing, what that money is doing. Is that money being spent in the interest of Uganda? I earlier this morning, Ray, we have so many businessmen who are being sent to prison. We have many businessmen and women who are closing shops because of taxes. No one wants to raise that. No one wants to say that. No one wants to see like these people deserve better. Should they be arrested and taken to prison for someone to build the mansion? And this is where I feel like I cannot say that we keep quiet. And I believe that it has taken us this long. The exhibition has opened so many eyes. 
everyone is concerned. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Borora. I, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, and to recommend you first of all for because you've been a consistent participant in in in, in this exhibition. Uh, we saw uh, the executive director of the Uganda Media Center describing this as. The haste of the year. I mean, the 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 siphoning of funds uh, from Parliament through personal accounts, and these are the things that have happened. But to, tonight we are discussing the way forward. I mean, how can we, you especially, uh, people who are who are inside the system, who are part of part and parcel of the government, who may have uh, uh, who people may listen to without without seeing them as biased, uh, like they they, they they would see the, the uh, members of the opposition. What sorts of actions? Uh, do you reckon we need to take to extend these efforts to get the people in power to respond to change the the, the course of uh, of uh, uh, to see the the people who are stealing these these funds brought to uh, to justice? Well, I think what has been detrimental to accountability in the past has been that if anything came up in regard to accountability, government officials keep quiet, the party in leadership keeps quiet, and now it is termed as an opposition campaign against the government. And what is different now is that those who subscribe to the party in the power, those who are in the government, are actually coming up to say, well, whereas you are our own, what you are doing is wrong. And the action now, the way forward now is that if the party in the power can come up to condemn their own, that is good enough because it has a toll on some individuals who belong to the party and they are doing what is against maybe the ideological ground of the party. The way forward is this time around, we are telling our own, one, if you are wrong, step aside. Two, this is not what we voted the party in power for. We wanted better. We wanted service. And you are not capable of giving us the services. Let me tell you, when I had the, 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 I had the, the, the demonstration on, on also on X about the COVID cars that were being used by ministers, these cars were returned. These cars were returned and they were deployed where they are supposed to be deployed. And that is what an opposition could not do because they say, our oh, opposition, what would we say? The fact that we have stood up and we are saying this is not what the party position is, the party position is we deliver better, we give better, we account more. That is what we told the party when we are looking for votes. And if the party, what actually, what is the, if I can give you, if I can preempt some of the things that are in, in, in the plan, is that we are going to push the NRM MT to make sure that they account for this. That is one. Two, we must have a statement from SEC because SEC is the one that elects, that makes choices, that does most of the top management business of the party. It must make a statement in this regard. We shall build the momentum, we shall build the pressure to give confidence. I am, I subscribe to the National Resistance Movement. We have just launched a register to go and register members. Why would members subscribe to us? Why do people would wish to come to us when in this particular moment, an issue that touches their lives, an issue that has a bearing on them, is being neglected. Then there is no reason we cannot give confidence to people to join the party when, when it comes to issues that affect them, we keep quiet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anderson. I, I request you to leave it there. Let me, let's uh, turn to uh, Yusuf. You, you have been a, um, and I had asked you this question before, you've been nudging our good friends in the opposition to uh, pick up where the uh, pick up on the efforts of the exhibition and take some action. But when we hosted um, the leader of opposition, I think two weeks before we hosted him, there had been a shadow cabinet meeting where one of the members uh, raised an issue about this same 100 million we are talking about. And uh, another senior leader in the opposition said, oh, oh if, you, if you go there, 95% of us are going to fall. Um, at the very next meeting after that, the item was supposed to be discussed further, but it didn't even show up on the on the agenda. What's your reading of the attitude of the opposition? <laughs> okay. I have written in, in my column in the Observer at some point, maybe about three years ago, that we don't have an opposition in Uganda, but we have happy people on either side of the aisle. And that's exactly what we're witnessing right now, is that we have happy people on either side of the aisle. And in nudging them to move to censor, uh, Anita Monk, I'm actually trying to do two things. First, I'm hoping that maybe they could, right? And which I think would surprise me too, if they really did it. So I'm hoping they could do it. But the other thing I'm doing is trying to put them on the spot. Sort of, it's sort of reverse psychology. Maybe seek to embarrass them a little bit. Maybe seek to remind them that, you know, you have a duty. We expect you to do something in this direction. 
especially in light, not of the evidence, because the evidence they knew it a long time ago, but in light of the public anxiety, in light of the anger that now the public knows what all you guys knew. And because you're used to playing uh, politics of the gallery, maybe now uh, it's time to play some gallery politics. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm of the view that actually, I, I, I think even if they try because of their numbers, they might not really pull it off. But the gesture itself is, will be wonderful and commendable in the sense that there will be an attempt and there will be a debate in parliament over censoring the speaker, right? So that, that was my entire project, you know, try to push it, try to push it. Even when I know they are very happy uh, in receiving the packs of parliament, you know, I felt that because they are, to a degree, after the public, because, you know, they're happy to consume all these packs and bribes because they are, uh, I think, aware the public doesn't know. You see, so I feel like now that the public is aware and there's anger, maybe you could do something. And I felt it was so unfair. I was really angry. I was really angry when Bobo 19 wants to distract us by pushing the Mpuga thing away from the bigger thing. Because, you know, this, this is well known. Because it was an absolute destruction because there was a bigger thing. We're looking at the institution itself. Attack the institution. The institution itself is corrupt. Attack it. At least let the politics of, of the gallery not focus on yourselves. Focus the institution. At least for once. We know you might not change, but try to push it. And train it because like what we're doing right now, you know, it doesn't look like government is going to collapse the next day after the parliament exhibition. It doesn't mean that. But checking the excess of power is, is a full-time assignment. It has to be done endlessly, right? So that those holding power are aware that they're being watched so they can check their excesses because of the constant pushback that they get from the public. So that was the, if you, if you want me to respond to why I, I've been pushing uh, for censoring the speaker, and I'm still hopeful that they could do something about it, right? But, yeah? Yes, yes, Yusuf, I, I, I am curious. Um, I mean, I, I understand why, and you, I think you've very well articulated the why. Uh, but but the, why not? Uh, I mean, you touch a bit on it, but the the Bobby Wine or the leadership at uh, at NUP outside of Parliament, I mean, uh, why is it that they fear that there will be a worse revolt within the party? And it's not just NUP, it's uh, the FDC. Uh, I mean, it's been having its own challenges, but why don't we see a single two MPs uh, starting a, starting to collect signatures to take some kind of action against the leadership of, of Parliament? Because everybody's entangled. Everybody's hands are soiled. Right, right, you see, so I mean, this is a reminder we were making to everyone that you know there was a time when 40 million during the time of COVID was given to the MPs, uh, including many PMPs, and you did nothing. You know, the same thing happened, you have 100 million being debated. Uh, there's a lot of entanglement, everybody's entangled, everybody's hands are soiled, right? So, I think this explains why all of them are reluctant to uh, sort of start on this initiative. This is why this is asked from the outside who are actually even saying something like that. But, um, uh, Haga, if you could allow me. There's another point I wanted to debunk, right? And I think this is what we're looking at, and no one wants to say. Yusuf, may, yeah. may I ask to hold on that point? I asked Jared to comment on the very issue we are commenting on, and then I get back to you. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Jared, in, in uh, 2011, you, you, you tabled documents um, alleging or showing that senior ministers, uh, including uh, the Honorable Sam Kutesa, the former Foreign Affairs Minister, had received bribes from international oil companies. There was pushback from the executive uh, for debate on these um, documents not to take place. In 2012, there was a revolt in parliament over the passing of Serena Nebanda and, and how her death was was uh, handled. Of course, most of the, some of the members of parliament were vocal about the, their suspicion that she had been poisoned for taking a, a critical stance against the ruling government. In 2013, there was even, uh, you pushed things a notch higher. I mean, Parliament. Uh, the Honorable Medad Segona, who has been stammering of late, uh, led MPs in the collection of, of signatures, calling on Kadaga to reconvene Parliament. And, and, and I think they, they were not even shy about the intention to impeach uh, President Museveni for comments he had made. Now, all these were obvi obviously bigger things, but we didn't have, there was debate about the authenticity of your documents. There was debate about the allegations surrounding Nevander's death. There was debate about, um, I mean, the president had the right to make the, the statements, was his opinion, he was expressing himself. But now we have an unprecedented uh, level of evidence of a scale of corruption that we haven't seen before at parliament. Why is no single MP, why are members of the position, why is no Gerard Karahanga there? They are your colleagues, you must have these conversations with them. Why aren't we seeing that kind of action? Is it that the Honorable Anita Mong and uh, her deputy have 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 a, a stranglehold on, on, on this parliament? 
what's your comment about this? Uh, first, on a personal note, uh, let me, uh, earlier when I was talking about uh, challenging these matters, court, I hadn't realized that Senior Counsel David Mpanga is uh, here listening in. He's the one who led us in that court and uh, a number of my main engagements I appreciate and um, I think uh, every Ugandan would love to appreciate what he does and what other, other lawyers uh, and, and of his caliber have also consistently done. Uh, risk engagements, but really that mean much to our country. So it's a duty shift. Now to your question, uh, I mean, again, it goes back to the, to, to the culture, how, how again, or how we end up in this very place. You know, to be, to be very uh, sincere, I, there have been a number of engagements. Yes, the oil debate you talked about, the overwhelming evidence that these uh, uh, senior ministers had really shared money, uh, and uh, basically for influence. And literally, you almost saw zero action done against them from the executive. However, then at least we managed to achieve a few things. Uh, for the first time, we saw the laws being tabled, the bills again, because um, if you recall, then oil had been run as a personal project. The Ugandans had no idea what, officially what was happening in the oil sector. So, so many agreements were being signed with the multinational corporations. And, and Ugandans had literally no idea what was going on. So ordinary, we should even have had those laws passed before signing most of those agreements. And then two, you guys got at least some bit of glimpse of, of what was involved in those production sharing agreements. Uh, we pressed hard. They claimed their confidentiality clauses. We pressed and pushed them, and at least we were able to see a bit of, of, of some of those agreements and, and question some, some, of the, of some of the things. And, and so the subsequent ones, people now, whoever was involved, knew that the public would get to see some of these things. And so they, they kind of tried to, to create some, some... There was some bit of um, a baby step in terms of getting better agreements. Now, I think... So we have, again, you see this culture of, of basically, it's, it's, it's a culture of politics of patches. Um, I think as early as 1996, that election was somehow, you know, uh, um, you can say somehow genuine, but then that's when people started seeing money in, in, in elections. Now, in 2001, we saw lots of money in elections. Now, this money goes to, remember, the same day we're electing the president, the same day we elect members of parliament. And so it ends up being used as a tool, as a tool. Well, uh -huh. so, hello, hello. Yes, no, you can hello. hear everything. Okay. Yes, I think um you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, good. So, I so so this money thing became the the the, the tool processor. So it's so we see money being used consistently and. And so you end up with a huge parliament, and, uh, and if you check the processing of these colleagues, the majority of the members, basically the tool that is used is money. Now, and so I must indeed play along system. And so uh, until we Ugandans get bold enough and say, wait a minute, these fellows pick money from us through these taxes, and then this money is taken back in the elections, and then they use it. We They give it to us. We take them back to parliament. They go and do all sorts of crazy things. Still the same money that they point from us. So, so it becomes a cycle. So it, I mean, we really have to be bold enough and say, this must stop. So you'll have a number of years. These engagements, um, I mean, like uh, the, the, the documents we are seeing now, 